whether you are a new or old tomato grower or one that's done it for quite a while, uh, you can increase your success with these really good tips from Master Gardener Joan Cloutier. You will learn how to some correct planting methods, pest control, irrigation, soil management, and fertilizer that can help produce healthy and productive plants. Also find out why selecting a good variety for your garden or container will also contribute to producing a good crop of tomatoes. She's been a UC Master Gardener since 2009. And uh, I did choose this video because Santa Clara County does have similar zones to the Central Coast. Uh, they're in USDA zones 9B and 10A, and also sunset zones 15 and 16, and some 7. Um, there will be many tips suggested that will work for our area. However, when it comes to the zone 17, which is here in Los Osos, right here on the coast, we might need to listen to a few more specific tips for the coast. So at the end of her talk, I have a couple of pretty short videos. One of them is specific to the coast, Scott Daygray of Rogers Garden, and then Hope Merkel from Los Osos Valley Nursery will demonstrate a special pruning technique that she says is very effective for growing tomatoes here in the cooler climates. I hope you can stay a few minutes after the program and share any experiences you've had growing tomatoes in our area. So now I'm going to begin the first video. And if you have any trouble seeing or hearing, send me a message in the chat and we'll take care of it. Management to the public. Tonight's program is being co-sponsored by the Palo Alto Library. We're grateful for their support. And now I'd like to introduce your presenter for this session, Joan Clodier. Joan has been a UC Master Gardener volunteer since 2009. And with that, Joan, why don't you take it away? Okay, tonight, um, yeah, thank you for coming here tonight. And um, we're going to talk about tomatoes, growing tomatoes in your garden. So we're gonna discuss things like planting practices, soil fertilizer, staking, pruning, watering, and some other cultural requirements, as well as um, diseases and insect pests and a few varieties, a little bit about varieties too. So let's see here. Okay, so one of the things I wanna mention is that, um, let me do something to the screen here. Okay, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, all. Um, all are very closely related and they do have similar requirements. So a lot of the things we talk about here tonight will also apply to uh, peppers and eggplants. So they're all in the Solanaceae or the nightshade family. Okay, why um, are tomatoes so popular? They are definitely the most popular warm season crop that people like to grow. First, um, tomatoes can produce fruit for about four months sometimes longer. So it's a long-term crop. You can get a lot of tomatoes. Um, a good plant could yield, you know, 20, 28 pounds of fruit, in some cases, maybe even higher. So if you're getting like 12 or 14 pounds of fruit, there's probably something wrong or maybe, you know, cultural practices or the variety you picked or something like that. Because most tomatoes, you should, should get about 20 or 28 pounds of fruit on a plant. Um, and the other reason why it's so, they're so popular, there's so many dishes and cuisines and different types of foods that use tomatoes. All right, um, seeds. We'll talk about seeds versus transplants. Okay, um, you still could plant tomato seeds if you wanted to. Don't have too much of a window left, but if you plant them within the next week, you will still have enough time because um, you should start seeds maybe about six to eight weeks before you plant them outside in your garden. So anyway, um, if you start them you know, pretty soon, you should be okay. With a heating pad, the seeds will germinate much quicker. 
Usually tomato seeds might take six to 12 days, but if you have them on a heating pad or temperatures 70 to 86 degrees, they could germinate in like four to eight days. You have a lot of choices if you plant seeds. There's lots of new varieties, disease resistant varieties, just lots of choices. Um, lots of different types of tomatoes that you can get from seed. But if you, know, if you don't have the conditions to grow your own seeds or you don't have the time, um, and some of you probably don't, you could get transplants from the garden center. And there are still some pretty good tomato varieties that I'll point out later that are pretty reliable and that are somewhat disease resistant that you could get and have good flavor. But when, if you buy transplants or you know, plants from the garden center, you wanna look for quality plants. Those sitting around for a few weeks might not be so good, especially if they've been outside in the cold nighttime temperatures, because in most of our areas, we're still getting temperatures in the 40s or mid 40s at night. And that's kind of cold for tomatoes. They can get a lot of diseases, especially in the low or mid 40s, 40 degrees temperatures. And also, if we get a cold rainstorm, tomatoes do not like cold rainstorms. They can get all kinds of, or they're more likely to get diseases if they go through a cold rainstorm. So just think of that, I don't know, it might rain Friday, I guess, tomorrow, <laughs> or no, Saturday. So just think about this. Okay, if you've already purchased tomatoes, and it's really early to plant tomatoes in your garden right now, but if you've already purchased them and didn't plant them yet, what you might want to do is take them in at night because again, the 45 degree temperatures at night are not good for tomatoes and the roots will not grow very well if it's in the 40s at, in night, at nighttime. But then you could take them to warm outside in a warm sunny location during the day. And you should have some, a pretty good tomato plant if you do this. You know, take them in at night and put them out during the day. And that should solve the problem if you've already bought them. Okay, when to plant, like I just mentioned, soil must be warm. Some experts think that the temperature of the soil should be at least 55 or higher. You know, it, it kind of depends. You have a little leeway on that, but if you're still getting night temperatures, like I said before, in the 40s or mid 40s, you're at high risk of getting diseases. So, when to plant a safe bet for planting tomatoes in the bay area would be like the end of april or beginning of may and definitely at least the second half of april if you're going to plant them um, the roots just don't grow in cold soil and then you have all kinds of possible problems not just root diseases but foliar diseases too so you just you know, they might be okay, but you're taking a, a real high risk if you plant them this time of the year. And I just hate it when I see all these tomatoes in the garden center already. It's way too early. <laughs> and watch the weather before planting also. If there is a big cold rainstorm coming, you better hold off until after that rainstorm. So again, planting early will not give you a head start. You will not get earlier tomatoes just because you planted them early because the roots just don't grow much if it's cool. All right. Okay. Some other things about planting tomatoes. It's a good idea to plant them in a sunny area. Boy, eight hours or more of sun would be ideal. Tomatoes can survive if you have maybe six hours of sun or more, but boy, when you get below six hours of sun a day, you know, uh, you just won't get the yield. You, you may have, you know, you just won't have a real super healthy plant. But if you're just determined you wanna to plant tomatoes and you only have maybe five or four and a half hours of sun, but you really wanna to plant tomatoes, try cherry tomatoes. Because some of the cherry tomatoes, and I, I've seen other master gardeners who claim, oh, look at these cherry tomatoes and they look really good. I only get like this one guy, he was planting them in pots near some redwood trees where he doesn't get much sun. And I couldn't believe it. He said he was only getting four and four and a half hours of sunlight, but he had cherry tomatoes and he was still getting pretty good, you know, pretty good plants and pretty good yield for cherry tomatoes under those conditions. So if you're on a patio or something and you're not getting six or eight hours of sun, but you're getting maybe close to that, try cherry tomatoes. They're the easiest usually. Um, it's really advantageous to add compost to your um, soil area. Compost has so many benefits. 
um, it's really the best amendment to add because there are beneficial microbes and compost that will help your plants absorb water and nutrients. So it's really good. Um, composted manure is a good addition at this time when you're planting. You can plant that, but watch the rates on the package, on the bag that you buy it in, and it'll say how much per thousand square feet. Don't go too high because manure, well, it can have some salts, and if you go too high, you, there is uh, some danger you could burn the roots, especially if it's uh, chicken manure. So just stay within the rates on the package. Okay, if you're not using that, um, nitrogen fertilizer, you can use a low rate at this time. A point I wanna make is that tomatoes use more nitrogen than any other element. So, and if you're planting in your garden soil outside, usually we say nitrogen may be the only element you really need. Um, so a nitrogen, something with nitrogen in, but only use a low rate when you're planting because when you're planting, you just don't need much and if you're using manure, then skip the, the other nitrogen uh, fertilizer application. Um, okay. Oh, and fresh manure. I want to make a comment there. It could burn, and there are some food safety concerns with fresh um, manure on food crops. So you may want to make sure you buy composted manure. And anything in the bags in the garden center um, should be composted at really, usually they use it's it's really hot temperatures they compost so you should be okay okay when you plant your tomatoes um okay you want to plant deep okay and the reason for that is because tomatoes will they will actually put on more roots on the stem so if you see this tomato plant on the left side the original root ball they dug it up and the planting depth was here they got some more roots right here after they planted it a secondary root ball so this is what happens if you plant them deep. And this is good. You want lots of roots, so that's good. So here you can see the person is planting there. Okay, if you're planting tomatoes or, I mean, peppers or eggplants, this does not apply to peppers and eggplants. They don't form the adventitious roots like tomatoes do. So you plant them even with the soil. Okay, here's another example. You can plant them sideways, that's fine, because look at, you'll get another root ball somewhere in there. So that's good. All right, spacing. Spacing is important because you wanna allow lots of space between the plants um, because crowded plants have more potential to harbor diseases and insect pests. Okay, make sure you read the plant tag or the seed package, or if they didn't give you information, try to look it up on Google or something, your variety, because the, there's so many different varieties that have different spacing requirements. There's tomatoes that get eight feet tall and four feet wide, three feet or four feet wide, and, and some only get like two and a half feet tall and you know a foot and a half wide. So they do have different spacing require, requirements. Um, okay, yeah, like too much crowding, um, you, you just encourage more aphids and more other pests, diseases, because you're not getting enough air circulation and light. You want lots of air circulation and light to go into the plant. All right, there is something called high density tomato, high density planting of tomatoes. This is a way to try out more varieties if you want. Um, you won't necessarily get you know, a higher yield when you do that. You wanna treat it like one plant, but you could put two different plants in one hole and treat it like one plant. Um, so row, row and spacing guidelines should be followed and it would be good to use similar growth habit tomatoes like either two determinate tomatoes or two indeterminate tomatoes. And we'll get to that in a few minutes, okay? But get similar sized plants. And pruning will be probably be necessary. You're gonna to have to do a little pruning, which is okay. You can prune tomatoes, um, it doesn't hurt them at all. So. I do this with sometimes I try two different cherry tomatoes in one large pot and then I can try out new varieties because there's so many tomatoes, new varieties I want to try out every year and I don't have space for everything. And this does work very well for cherry tomatoes, by the way. So it's just another thing you can try if you want. <clears throat> All right, mulch between plants. Mulch really helps retain moisture. It helps with weed control. There's a lot of materials you can use for mulch. 
And organic mulch is good because eventually it will turn into compost. And um, compost, of course, is really good for your plant roots. Um, now you can, okay, you can use plastic, like the, here there, you'll see a plastic mulch down there. Okay, you can use plastic, but the only thing where there's sure a lot of waste disposal problems with plastic. So I kind of hesitate about plastic right now. If you can reuse some black plastic you had or something, that might be okay. And the other thing, um, plastic that's used in agriculture with soil particles on it is not recycled. It's thrown in the garbage, in the dump. It goes right to the dump site. At this point in time, maybe it'll change next year or three years from now. But at this, I've been reading a lot about this and there is no agricultural plastic that's used for mulch that's recycled at this point in time. So it's something to think about. But pl black plastic mulch will warm the soil quite a bit. So again, if you have some and you can reuse it or something, you know, it's an option. Okay, staking tomatoes. One of the things that's, that would be good is to stake your plants early. And I've made this mistake with staking where I plant the tomato plants, and then I don't get around to putting the stakes in and like these round stakes, like the Texas tomato stakes or these type of stakes. Oh my gosh, if you wait till the plant gets larger, it's, it's real difficult to get all the branches in, in the right place. So do it early and you'll save yourself a lot of time. There's a wide variety of staking ideas and our own um, website, um, MGS Santa Clara UCN ANR. Okay, that has a whole section on staking on our website, Santa Clara Math Learner website. And there's lots of great ideas on there that you can stake. So if you have a big indeterminate plant that gets six or eight feet tall, you want to use sturdy stakes. This staking on the upper right hand corner, that's not going to hold some of the tomatoes. But if you had a determinate plant, this um, stake on the upper right hand corner would probably be okay if it's a small plant. So again, read your plant tag or seed package or whatever and try to find out how big your plant might get. And then you can decide what type of stakes you use. And there's a lot of um, things you can use other than wire, you know, these wire Texas tomato stakes and stuff like that. So again, you know, go to our website and there's some really cool ideas on there. Okay, pruning tomatoes. This is especially helpful when growing these big indeterminate varieties because you, sometimes you have so much foliage there. Um, therefore, some pruning is almost necessary. It also helps some light penetrate into the plant and air circulation. Because like I said before, if you don't have enough light and air circulation, your plant won't be as healthy and you're going to get more insect pests, such as maybe aphids, things like that. And slugs and snails sometimes too will crawl in a real moist, um, uh, lots of foliage. They like that. So you're just kind of encouraging that. So some pruning is fine. And this picture shows where to prune. Sometimes between the main stem and the leaves, you can take some of those off there and it will not hurt the plant. And the other thing, if you have a long um, tomato vine that's going over your pathway or something, you can cut it off. Don't worry. Tomatoes can, can take it, to, can tolerate it very easy. So don't be afraid to do some pruning on your tomatoes or cutting a long branch that's um, interfering with your walking path. Okay. Okay. Okay, watering. Try to um, maybe water um, near the root system, not the foliage, um, because you know, tomatoes can get some foliar diseases if they stay wet all the time. So if you can point the nozzle, if you're overhead watering, point it closer to the root system. You know, if you get some water on the foliage, it's not the end of the world. But, you know, if you can get more to the right to the root system, that would be good. <laughs> okay, you can cut back on and watering toward the end of the season. As the plant begins to fruit, you can, if you're in the soil, in garden soil in your backyard or whatever, um, you can start reducing water, you know, maybe even in August a little bit and more, a lot more in September. And usually by the end of September or mid-September, you can almost cut off your water, but not containerized plants. If you're growing tomatoes in containers, in pots, 
um, no, don't cut off the water. <laughs> so you, the plant could wilt and, and die um, in a few days. So you don't want to do that. Okay, um, a few other things on fertilizer, and there were a few things I forgot to say before. Okay, so every fertilizer um, package has three numbers on it. These are the three essential elements. Nitrogen is the first element. And like on these two packages, the blood meal, it's a 12, zero, zero. So the 12 means 12% 12 nitrogen. Okay, so that, um, okay, so it's, there are state laws and laws that require what you have to put on the fertilizer bag. So you have to put the amount of NPK, nitrogen is the first number, phosphorus and potassium is the third number. You have to put that on the package. And um, nitrogen is the first number. Now, tomatoes use more nitrogen than anything else. So if you're going to buy a new bag of fertilizer or a new package, it would be nice if nitrogen could be your highest number. Because if you get a lot of phosphorus and potassium and you're in the soil, your garden soil or your, your ground, um, our clay in California contains a lot of the other elements. It does contain you know, a lot of our trace elements and also the phosphorus and potassium. So you usually don't have to add much of that, if any at all. You know, if you're adding compost, you, know, you may not have to add any. So you're kind of, we feel you're kind of wasting your money and wasting resources if you use a lot of phosphorus and potassium in your so garden soil. But nitrogen is the important one. Um, okay, here on the right-hand side, here's a fertilizer bag. It's a 20 5 10. Okay, so that's okay. At least nitrogen is higher than the other um, two numbers. So that's good. Now, sometimes you say, oh, 20%, isn't that high? But the rates are on the package are worked out for you. You don't have to figure out anything. If you use a, a 5, 3, 2, or something, a 5%, you're going to use more. But the rates are figured out for you. If you use a 20% nitrogen um, fertilizer, you're going to use less, but the the rates of application on the package will work. It'll work out because that's what they do. They have to put the correct rate for that analysis. So don't worry about that. Just follow the directions, and you should be fine. Now, one of the things we say is, um, you know, if you're in garden soil, don't use a lot of nitrogen really frequently. Like a little bit when you're planting, and then we'll talk about another time of the year when the tomatoes use a lot of fertilizer or nutrients, but you don't want to fertil over fertilize, like don't fertilize all the time and use high rates and all that because you can attract pests like aphids to your foliage if, if your foliage contains real high levels of nitrogen. So go maybe toward the lower rates that are on the package. Every package has a rate, like it might say one to five pounds per hundred or per thousand square feet or something like that. Go toward the lower end of the spectrum. Don't go the five pounds or or over that, you know, go toward the lower end if you're in, you know, clay soil. Now, if you're in a container though, growing a potted plant, um, potted tomatoes in a container, then you need a complete fertilizer. You need the phosphorus and potassium, and you also need the trace elements because in potting soil, there's not very much of anything in there. So yes, then it's a different story. And then look at the application rates and on the package and that'll kind of tell you when it runs out of steam if it says re if it's a water soluble uh, fertilizer and it says apply in two weeks that means it's it's run out in two weeks if it says reapply in two weeks but usually you know you, you got some leeway leeway there you don't have to fertilize every single two week period okay so here's some more examples nitrogen phosphate potassium here's another fertilizer, oh, and they have to put a guaranteed analysis. So if you're looking, you're wondering, does it have trace elements in because I'm in a container and does it have phosphate and potash or phosphorus and potassium in it? So then look at the guaranteed analysis. This one has iron and manganese, zinc, um, magnesium. So this has, you know, most of your, your main trace elements in it. Okay. Okay, let's see. Joan, this is yes. Sharon. Well, okay. while we're while you're on fertilizer, um, TT somebody whose initials are TT asked when you said low rate earlier for like manure and fertilizers, what did you mean by low rate? Good, good question. I'm glad you asked because 
Okay, so on the package, they're gonna show, you look at the directions, right? And the directions might say, use one to five pounds of this product per thousand square feet. So that's the rate, that's how much you use, right? So the one pound, it says one to five pounds. That's a range, right? You could use one pound per thousand square feet or five pounds. So the lower rate would be the one pound. The higher rate would be five pounds per thousand square feet. Every fertilizer package usually has a range on it. For water solubles, they might say a half teaspoon to one teaspoon or a half teaspoon to one tablespoon per gallon of water. And then you mix it and water it in. Okay, the half teaspoon per gallon of water would be the low rate. If you use a tablespoon per gallon, that's the higher end, the high rate. Okay, did I explain that? That, that works. And what okay. if you're getting manure from your neighbor who has chickens or you're using alfalfa pellets or something that doesn't really have a bag with directions? Yeah, that's more of an amendment. Um, Oh boy, there you'd probably, <laughs> you'd probably have to go on the web and I don't have directions for that right now. And if I, yeah, you'd probably have to do some research on that yourself, but um, be careful again about manure that's not composted. So Great. you Thanks, could, if you're, if you're sure it's really well composted by your neighbor, you know, you might want to look online and what the manure packages say, but if it gets something equivalent, like if it's a chicken manure or you really have to kind of be careful with chicken manure. I know a lot of people who've burnt plants with chicken manure. Manures can have a lot of salts in them. So you don't want to use high, high rates or anything um, too, yeah, anything too high, or you could burn the plants. So you might want to look, um, you know, if you're getting composted manure from a neighbor, if it's steer manure or horse manure, look online and see if there are any packages that packaged products that have that and look at what their rates are and kind of make a judgment from there. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay, so um, fertilize when blooms and fruit appear. The tomato plant uses most of the nutrients when it is flowering and beginning to produce fruit, like this stage. You see this little fruit on the tomato plant and it's blossoming like crazy right now. This is a good time to fertilize, okay? So, and make sure you water enough after, after fertilizing. Again, look at the package directions and you don't have to use the high rates either. You know, with our soil, um, you know, you should be able to use the lower end of the spectrum when they have the range of rate. Like, okay, now if, you, if you're using a water soluble fertilizer, um, you don't have to really water it in because it's already diluted. They already tell you like a half teaspoon per gallon and then you water it in. But if you're using a granular or slow release fertilizer, make sure you water enough after fertilizing because nutrients have to be in a liquid state to be absorbed by the plant roots. So if you just sprinkle some stuff on top and it never leaches down to the plant, to the plant roots, you're not fertilizing. So now if you're in a container, um, make sure again, you use a complete fertilizer one with the uh, micronutrients or minor elements in it and the phosphorus and potassium. You need all of, all of it if you're watering, I mean, if you're um, fertilizing and you have your tomato plants in containers or pots. Okay. Okay, what varieties to plant? There's all kinds of things you can look at. You want early, late, and a lot of plant takes will show days to harvest or seed packages especially. Disease resistance, that's a good thing. There's some pretty bad diseases around here. <laughs> so shape and size, it's what you like. But cherry tomatoes are pretty darn easy to grow. If you haven't grown tomatoes before, you might want to consider that. There's paste, beefsteak, and all kinds of others. Colors, flavors, compact versus big plants. There's determinant versus indeterminate plants. Okay, indeterminate. Um, Okay, first, um, there's really not a big difference in yield. Now, I will say, if you get an indeterminate tomato plant, 
and your season lasts really, really long, say we have really warm weather into the end of October and not very cool, cold nights, you might get a little more yield or a few more tomatoes on the indeterminate tomato plants. But it's more of a variety difference. What variety you choose has a bigger difference than whether you choose a determinate or indeterminate plant. Okay, but anyway, an indeterminate tomato will continue growing until either frost kills them or cold weather makes them go downhill really a lot. And then sometimes they get diseases at the end and just kind of die off. <laughs> they need really tall, sturdy cages, the indeterminate. But again, look at your plant tank because there are some indeterminate plants like um, I think Better Boy, and it doesn't get that large and it still produces you know, a lot of tomatoes and everything. Okay, so if you're indeterminate, you might want to like get the, the sturdy cages. These are Texas tomato cages. And again, you could use other things than that too to stake them, but you need staking. <laughs> okay, now determinant varieties, they stay a lot shorter. They might only get two to four, maybe five feet high or so. So um, sometimes standard tomato cages might work. If you get a really indeterminate I mean, a determinate variety that's really, really short. You might even use those real flimsy, cheap tomato cages that they sell. <laughs> so again, look at the tomato description and the, you know, on the plant tag or the seed package and the size, or maybe do some research on Google or something and see if you can find your variety and find that information out. Um, many of the container varieties are determinate plants. So determinant plants, determinant tomatoes will produce most of their tomatoes within a few weeks, but they will, they'll continue to produce some after that, but not, not lots of them, where maybe indeterminate are maybe a little more consistent in their production. All right, and now hybrids versus heirlooms. I know a lot of people who haven't grown tomatoes before, you ask them, what are you going to grow? What do you think? Oh, I want to grow all heirlooms. The word heirloom, it does sound really nice and they taste good, but you might want to look at it really carefully. But first, I'll tell you a hybrid. It's not a GMO, by the way. I always get asked that. But a hybrid is just a result of a cross of two different tomato plants. And the plant breeder is trying to get the best characteristic of each of the parent plants. So hybrids are produced under really strict conditions in um, screened cages in greenhouses so they don't have outside influences like wind or insects that won't will affect the outcome. So the seed is very consistent on hybrids. Um, okay, hi, let's see, what else? Oh, heirlooms, they're open pollinated by wind or insects and the seeds you collect or somebody else collects usually contain most of the characteristics of the plant that it came from. But sometimes there are some variation you, you might, um, especially if you had some different tomato, tomato plants in the immediate area, sometimes you do get more variability with heirlooms. I noticed even when I buy seeds, um, there are some heirloom seeds I've bought that one year, maybe the heirloom tomatoes are real big, the next year they're like, they almost look different and they're really small, the same variety. So you do get some, sometimes some variation, variation with heirlooms. Okay, um, most heirlooms have um, longer days to harvest. Most of them mature later in summer, although there are a few earlier varieties too. Um, let's see here. Okay, disease resistance. Um, this is a big one because, okay, most of your hybrids are a lot more disease resistant than heirlooms. Heirlooms, um, a lot of the heirloom tomatoes are not very disease resistant. Okay, days to harvest, like I said, a lot of the heirlooms take longer, but not, not all of them. There are a few early varieties. Yield, in most cases, the hybrids will give a bigger yield than the heirloom tomatoes. Um, shelf life, the hybrids usually have a better shelf life. Like if you leave them on your kitchen counter for a week or two, usually they have pretty good shelf life. Flavor, this is where, you know, it depends who you talk to and what variety you talk about, that some heirlooms might have a better flavor. So these are all the things you have to judge. Uh, 
But although some of the newer hybrids, and there are still some like Better Boy that have pretty hybrids that have pretty darn good flavor. The other thing comment I want to make is that, you know, if you pick your tomatoes when they're ripe, even if they're um, hybrids, as long as they're ripe and you don't put them in the refrigerator right away, <laughs> you still should have pretty darn good tomatoes. Because um, one of the things about grocery store tomatoes, they put them in the cooler and it wrecks the flavor. So, all right. Okay, some of the types of tomatoes, geez, there's classics and beef steaks, but a lot of these categories are getting mixed up because there's lots of new varieties that are hybrids between the two. So you have, um, you have paste tomatoes and grape tomatoes, and a lot of tomatoes are in between and size-wise, and I don't know what you call them. And sometimes slicers are called classics or large classics are called beef steaks. And it also depends on the seed company. I've seen the same variety in different seed catalogs. Some they, they put classic, some they put beef steak. So don't get too, uh, don't, you know, these terms aren't that meaningful, I guess. Okay, here are some that are usually considered classic, like Better Boy. And by the way, that's still a pretty darn good tomato, pretty good flavor. Um, I went to a, a seminar with this professor who specializes in home garden varieties. Um, at one of the universities. And he said, you know, you go to the garden center, if you buy Better Boy, you'll do fine. It's productive, you know, good flavor. You can find it almost everywhere. Okay, Whopper, sometimes they consider that. That's getting pretty popular too. That also has pretty good flavor, but that can also be considered a beef steak because it gets larger. And then Celebrity's been around for a while. I think that was um, the patent went to somebody right in this area here in the Gilroy area, and then Early Girl. And there's another one called Big Beef. It's not a classic, it's a beef steak, but that's a real consistent variety too. That's also a hybrid. Okay, here, this Stupici, I think that's a, uh, an heirloom, and Green Zebra is an heirloom. These are some more that they classify as classics. Here again, Celebrity, Mountain Magic. Okay. Big beef, I, I should say, if you see that at the garden center, that's a pretty good, reliable um, tomato. And it, uh, the fruit is big, the yield is really good, flavor is really good. So that would be one to consider, you know, if you're at the garden center. Um, here are some more beef steaks and paste, a lot of different paste tomatoes. Okay, so paste tomatoes, the difference here is that they don't have as much water, they're not as watery. They are thicker, they make a thicker sauce. That's why they make these into um, tomato paste or um, salsa, or you can use them you know, for tomato sauce and they won't be as runny or as watery. And cherry tomatoes. These are probably the easiest to grow. Even under conditions that aren't fantastic, you usually will get some yield when you grow cherry tomatoes. And there's lots of different varieties. There's some really, this is a really compact variety, this Terenzo. Then you, you, there's just lots of varieties to pick from. Okay, again, they're very easy. So if you're a beginning gardener and you haven't grown tomatoes before, you, you really should consider having a cherry tomato in your garden. You won't, you shouldn't be disappointed. Okay. And there's lots of, oh, grape tomatoes too. They're kind of, same size as cherry tomatoes, although this one here is kind of in between a paste and a cherry. They're good. This Juliet, what a producer. That produces huge yields and they're really good and they make good, um, I cut them in half and put them in the dehydrator. Real good, sweet dehydrated tomatoes. Okay, and here's some more patio and container varieties. Um, these two are in my yard. I grow some cherry tomatoes in pots and they do just fine. Bush Early Girl, it's kind of a bush type Early Girl that does real well in pot in containers. So there's a lot more container varieties now because the size of the lots are getting a lot smaller. Okay, here are some more, just for your information here. Some are getting really small too. And this um, Red Robin, this is a super compact. It's only a, like an eight inch plant. I've grown this, but the flavor isn't the greatest, but it's real early. And maybe that's why some of the earliest tomatoes, maybe um, it's not warm enough yet for the flavor to develop. 
Okay. There's also the indigo varieties. They're really high in anthocyanin, antioxidants. Um, the breeder is in, or I think, Oregon State somewhere, Oregon State University. But you've got to pick these when the fruit softens and when it's ripe. If you pick these when they're purple and hard, oh, geez, they are so bitter. Um, you're, you'll spit them out immediately. <laughs> so wait till they show a little color and until they're soft. And they are really sweet. They are sweet. And some of the, they have a new one, indigo kumquat that I'm trying this year. That's supposed to really be good. All right. And then there's grafted tomatoes. I was saying that a lot of the heirlooms are not very disease resistant. Well, for root diseases, there's a solution. And they do a lot of grafting of heirlooms onto um, a tomato plant that has really good resistance against like uh, fusarium and verticillium wilt disease that attack the roots. Okay, so anyway, they, they cut off, they grow a plant, like for the rootstock, they cut it off and then they graft the heirloom variety on top. And I did that this once, one year, and about half of them made it, but you need hands like a surgeon. It's not that easy. It's kind of difficult <laughs> in a way. So, um, yeah, you have to be very patient and have good hands. Okay, growing in a container. Um, I want to make a couple last points about growing in a container. Your plant selection would be important. A somewhat compact plant would usually work best. Cherry tomatoes grow good in containers too. So I want to make that point that you don't want to get an indeterminate plant that grows eight feet tall. You need a gigantic container for that and it would be hard to manage. Okay, and also when you're growing in a container, the soil, watering, and fertilizer are very important. You wanna use a potting soil that drains well. Don't use your clay soil and put that in your container because you won't probably have enough porosity or, and drainage. Um, you wanna keep the soil moist, but never soggy like a sponge. You shouldn't be able to, to it shouldn't be mushy or soggy. And, but you have to watch the moisture because containers can dry out really fast. And if you go away for the weekend and your tomato plant is in a container and it's in July and it's hot out, you may come back on a Sunday night and your, your tomato might be dead because once it gets beyond the permanent wilting point, that's it. <laughs> so you've got to watch the moisture. And the other point that I made before, you want to, when you fertilize, you want to use a complete fertilizer, one with nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and the minor elements and follow the directions for reapplication. And directions have the rate also that you should use, how much to use. The rate is how much to use. All right, um, okay. So growing in a container, yeah, plant selection. I think I did that already. All right, a few things on diseases, pests and disorders. Okay, let me see what we have here. Okay, one of the most common diseases I would say in our area would be verticillium wilt. That's the middle picture there where the tomatoes are kind of wilting, um, turning yellowish and wilting. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but first um, we'll talk about, oh, disease resistant. Okay, if you get, if you buy a tomato plant, hopefully either on the seed package or in the seed catalog or on the plant tag, um, they will show what diseases that tomato plant is resistant to. Now, if it says resistant, it doesn't mean it won't ever get the disease, but if it gets it, it may not be as serious. They're usually stronger plants if they have some resistance. Okay, so there's V for verticillium, and I'm not gonna go through all this, tobacco mosaic virus, but I'll show you a few of these um, diseases and viruses here. Okay. Uh, fusarium wilt and verticillium wilt are two real common uh, disease, root diseases of our plant, of tomatoes. The first signs of, ver of fusarium wilt are yellowing of shoots and leaves. Sometimes it just occurs on a branch or half the plant. You can see on the right hand side what it looks like. Um, what it does, this disease, it plugs up the vascular system in the plant, the con water conducting tissue, the xylem in the stem. So then there won't be water and nutrients going up into the plant and it gets yellow and it wilts for lack of water. And you might think, oh, I need more water, but that's not the problem. It's a root disease. Same thing with verticillium. Um, this one is probably the most <clears throat> common in California, more than fusarium wilt. 
it's very widespread in California soils. And again, the first sign is often yellowing, sometimes between the main veins and older leaves. They'll turn brown, wilt, and die. And this can persist indefinitely in the soil. But there are resistant varieties available. This is um, this verticillium wilt. OK, this is also um, a vascular. Uh, this also affects the vascular system. The water conducting tissue is affected. So you won't get water and nutrients up in the plant. So sometimes the plant starts out as kind of stunted and the fruit would be fairly small, even if sometimes a plant can survive verticillium wilt, but the plant just doesn't look healthy and the fruit is small. This disease is favored by cool spring weather, but symptoms might not show up until when the fruit develops. So this is another reason why not to plant in your soil too early because you can easily get verticillium wilt. By the way, this fungus, root fungus disease, also affects a lot of other uh, crops like cucumbers and uh, melons and things like that. So don't plant too early because in cold soils, it's even worse. Okay, so here's a picture of verticillium wilt. It's kind of hard to diagnose this. So here's um, verticillium and here's fusarium. Okay, University of California often tells growers, you might want to send in a sample to a lab because sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish between these two by just looking at the plant. <clears throat> Another bad disease are the viruses. Tobacco mosaic virus, really bad, really bad. The source could be contaminated seed. It's often introduced by tobacco users, can be carried on hands, clothes, anyone who uses tobacco, and sap seeding insects can spread it too. Aphids, leafhoppers, cucumber beetles can spread it. So contaminated plant material, it can stay, the virus can stay on um, other things in your yard for almost forever. And some of the symptoms are mottled, yellow, distorted, um, or puckery leaves. If you see a plant with real puckery leaves, especially the new growth, if it looks really strange and stringy or puckery, you may just want to pull it out. And especially if it's also stunted, pull it out and put it in your green waste container, which will be composted at real high temperatures. I wouldn't even put it in my compost pile. This tobacco mosaic virus will last almost forever. Here's another one. Again, you can see the growth is very distorted. Another virus, tomato, yellow leaf curl. Oh, by the way, tobacco mosaic virus, there are re lots of resistant varieties. The bre tomato breeders know this is a big problem. So they, there are a lot of resistant varieties there. Um, this one is kind of new to California, or it's one of the newer ones. There are some resistant varieties available. Um, this one we've had um, in Santa Clara County, especially in the South County, I know this has been a a big problem, tomato spotted wilt virus. Okay, the stunt, stunting is the first symptom. The plant just looks kind of stunted. It might have purplish leaves. Um, if you see this, you may want to destroy the plant, but when it gets fruit, the fruit may not get very large, but when it does ripen, it will look like these pictures here, real blotchy and spotted all over the place. And they're, they're edible, but they taste awful. You know, you're not going to want to eat them. They're awful. So if you see this, the best thing is to pull out the plant and put it in the green waste. The other thing to do is to control weeds because weeds are, can be hosts for the virus. Like in bindweed, we have a bad weed called bindweed. The bindweed can, can live and can be perfectly healthy. And the tomato spotted wilt virus can be in it. And what happens, the thrips, they feed on the bindweed then they go feed on tomato foliage and spread it. So the bindweed is like asymptomatic. It's very healthy, but it can live with this virus. And there's, I think, a few hundred plants that can live with this virus, this tomato spotted um, wilt virus. There are some resistant varieties. Unfortunately, there aren't too many that are sold at the garden centers right now. I always buy some seeds every year that, have, um, that are resistant to this because I've had this in my garden. And, you know, I want to um, have some insurance there. <laughs> so I always buy some seeds, some uh, resistant varieties. And there are more that are coming on the market, especially in the seed 
seed company catalogs. Okay, so um, the tomato spotted wilt virus, it's spread by thrips. Thrips are really, really small. So I was saying before, weeds can be the host for this virus. So control your weeds. Okay, russet mites. Okay, if we have a hot spell in summer, it's really hot and dry, you probably will get some russet mites. It affects almost everybody. They're a, a type of mite and it, they um, tend to feed on the bottom foliage first. You might notice browning of lower leaves that are starting to get real kind of bronzy. And if you look really, really, really close and take a magnifying glass, you might be able to see them, but they're very, very, very small. So if we have a hot spell you, and um, these russet mites can just, the population can explode during a hot spell. But don't worry so much. If you think you're going to lose the plant, yes, you can spray with wet above sulfur. But the problem with wet above sulfur, well, you have to use it under 90 degree Fahrenheit for one thing. But the other thing is it can kill your beneficial insects. A lot of times what happens, the russet mite population starts exploding, but then your beneficial insects will come in and take care of the problem, especially if we have a cool down then, if it gets a little cooler. So a lot of times um, some of the problems will take care of themselves. So unless it's really, really bad, you may not wanna spray. Because remember, even those safe organic products can kill um, beneficial insects. All right, tomato hornworm. There's the tobacco hornworm and the tomato hornworm. And sometimes they're both on one plant. But I wanna just comment the lower picture, if you ever see a caterpillar like this, if it's still alive, don't kill it because this thing isn't going to survive very long for one thing, because what happened is there was a braconid wasp that laid eggs inside this caterpillar and they hatched and the larvae came out and this caterpillar, um, there's no way it's going to survive. But what's going to happen is these larvae are going to turn into more braconid wasps and control a lot of your pests. So that's a good thing. So leave these, leave, leave it alone. If you see that, just leave it alone. Okay, tomato pinworm, this isn't a real serious thing. If you see a little bit of this, um, usually tomato pinworm is controlled by beneficial insects that are in your garden. You may see a, it looks like a pin prick on top near the stem end of the tomato. Just cut that part off and eat the tomato. Yeah, it it's, shouldn't be a big problem. Stink bugs can be kind of a nuisance. Some years they're worse than others. If you squish them, they smell really, really bad. Um, what they do, they kind of suck the juice out of the tomato skin and you get um, these white dry spots on your tomato and they don't taste that good. You can cut that off and eat the inside of the tomato, but then sometimes there's not much left. Um, usually, you know, some beneficial insects will control this. It's usually not a problem that's going to affect everything. I really don't know what to say for stink bu bugs because um, there aren't really any good like pesticides that are safe to use on this. So just try to pick them off if you see them and hopefully it, you won't get too much damage. You're never gonna have a, a garden with no damage. So you're gonna expect a little bit of damage in your garden, okay? Um, sometimes we've had pro um, questions in the helpline and there's two holes in a leaf and they say, what is this? What should I do? You know, you're always gonna have a little bit of damage because if you let the balance of nature work, there should be beneficial insects or critters that come in and eat some of this, some of these pests. Okay, aphids on tomato leaves. Um, aphids can transmit viruses too, and aphids are our most common garden pest. However, lots of beneficial insects love to eat aphids, and others just lay eggs inside of aphids and they hatch and eat the inside of the aphid out. So there is a lot of natural control for aphids. One of the things you can do is space your plants properly. Um, also maybe do some pruning if the foliage is too thick. Try not to water the whole plant, all the foliage if it gets wet. Aphids like moist, shady, thick conditions. So try to do um, whatever you can culturally to make your plant healthy. And you might still get a few aphids, but usually they won't be a big problem. 
If it's really bad, you can um, spray a heavy stream of water on your plant. Aphids are not strong insects. Once they get knocked down, usually ground beetles or something else will eat them up. So they're not strong insects. They can't crawl fast. There is insecticidal soap you could spray, but the problem that also will kill your beneficial insects. Okay, I just wanted to throw this in because I have, have said a few things about beneficial insects. These are just some plants if you have in your yard, they um, are really good for beneficial insects because if beneficial insects don't have pests to eat, they need pollen because it has protein. And these are some of the flowers that are nice to have in your yard, even cilantro and dill when it's flowering that attract beneficial insects and have pollen that beneficial insects like. Okay, fruit rot. Okay, um, try not to let many tomatoes touch the moist soil. That's why staking is good and keeping tomatoes off the ground. Um, maybe some mulch is a good idea, dry mulch. Try not to get everything wet when watering because you can get fruit rot and also slugs. If you get this, you might have slugs too or snails. Okay, um, here's a physiological problem, blossom end rot. Okay, this, they're still studying this quite a bit. It can be, it can be like a, um, a calcium uptake disorder. Um, sometimes you might see more of this during cloudy, humid weather. And it also can occur if soil moisture fluctuates a bit. Sometimes you have enough calcium in the soil, but the plant isn't taking it up. And I don't know, the verdict is still out on calcium sprays for the home gardener. Not sure that really is going to help much. It might be after the fact anyway. So the best you can do is try to maintain an even, even watering schedule. Some varieties are more susceptible than others. Some of the paste tomatoes are more susceptible. Also, scientists now think genetics plays a part in blossom end rot. And there's a lot of research being done right now. So we may have some varieties in the future that don't get blossom end rot. Even now, you, you will notice that some varieties like never get it. Like I noticed plum regal, which is a paste tomato. I grow plum regal every year. I've never had it on that, but I've had it on so many different paste tomatoes that I've grown, but not on the variety plum regal. Okay, um, sun scald. Okay, this is another um, problem. So you, you want to prune some of your foliage. It can be a problem on peppers too. You want to prune some of your thick foliage out, but you want, don't want to prune so severely that when it's sunny and hot that your tomatoes aren't covered with some foliage. So try to leave some foliage that's covering most of your tomatoes. And you're going to have a, maybe a few clumps that are out there in the sun. But this occurs especially when we get those hot spells in summer. If they say we're going to have four days of 100 degree weather, the other thing you can do, if you have on your tomato steaks, you might be able to get some clothespins and some white cloth and just put some shade where those tomatoes are exposed. I've done this um, at times and it does help where you just um, take some clothespins and some white cloth and stake it to your tomato steak on the southwest side of your tomato plant, and that will help. Okay. Okay, cat facing. Um, this can be a problem if you have real cool or hot weather during flowering sometimes, but some varieties are more susceptible. And again, the heirlooms are more susceptible to this than most of the hybrids. Um, so you might see some of that. You, you can just cut it off. There's nothing you can do once it happens. Okay, um, picking and storing varieties. Um, pick tomatoes when they begin to soften. You know, do not store in the refrigerator. Cold um, temperatures destroy flavor. Okay, and pick them when they're ripe. The picture on the, the right-hand side, okay, I'm gonna talk more about that picture, but when you see tomatoes in the store, they're usually picked green with hardly any pink color on the blossom end side at all. They're picked green. Then what do they do? They ship them to a cooler or a big warehouse that's really cold, like 40 some degrees, and they ripen them in there. So they're starting with no flavor and they're ripening them, but they're not gonna get much flavor. So then they put them in the, when they're red, they put them in the stores and you buy them, they taste like cardboard. Even those, one, the ones that say vine ripened tomatoes, 
they still don't really taste that great because sto the grocery stores, they all go through the, the cooler. So try not to put your tomatoes in the refrigerator. Um, but at the end of the season, if you have a bunch of green tomatoes like this here, you know, you can pick them and do what the commercial growers do, but don't put them in the refrigerator or cooler, but just store them in a box or something. And they probably will ripen. If there's any on the blossom end side of the tomato, if there's any pink showing at all, you know, they will definitely ripen and turn red. So you can, they, they won't taste that great, but you can use them for sauce or whatever you want. Okay. End of life. Okay, sometime, probably in mid or late October, you know, tomatoes will look like this. You're going to get black spot and fungal diseases on the fruit. The vines might not look so good because again, we're probably getting, you know, 42 or 45 degree nights and it's moist. Tomatoes don't do well in this, in this air, you know, this kind of weather. So there's nothing you can do here. It's weather related. So it's, it's telling you it's time to plant your cool season vegetables like broccoli or spinach or something, you know, but it's time to get rid of them and plan for next year and maybe keep some notes what worked and what didn't this year. So you have even a better crop next year. Okay, and with that, um, I think you can enjoy your tomato harvest, not just in summer, but all winter, because there's a lot of things you can do with tomatoes. You can dry them, dehydrate them. Um, you can make tomato sauce. You can make tomato, if you don't want to can the tomatoes, you can freeze the tomato sauce and it'll last for a long time. So you can enjoy tomatoes all winter as well as summer. Okay, and I think that's, I think that's it. <laughs> Excellent, Joan. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that show. I do have those two really short videos. If you have a little patience for just specific for the coast. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you those. If you're um, this one that I'm going to show you is tom tomato pruning on the coast at Los Osos Valley Nursery. And this is a whole new way of pruning. I've never tried it, but Hope recommends it. So let's take a look. Hi, everybody. It's Hope from Los Osos Valley Nursery. So I thought I would do an, a little tutorial on tomato pruning and um, answer some questions that we've had recently. Um, so we've been really busy at the nursery, so I haven't had time to come out every day and prune like I normally would. And I should be doing the tutorial on these, but they're in their uh, wall of waters that I have to get online because we can't get them anymore. But um, these really need to be pruned and I'll prune those up later. But uh, there's a technique that's for coastal climates. So it would be from anywhere along the coast of California, um, anywhere where you have colder nights, um, maybe foggier days where we don't get the heat. So this is a cool climate technique um, and I believe can't, it's a German technique so um, but it is to prune your tomatoes up so when you buy a tomato and sometimes you see the two coming out I would suggest looking for just one coming out of the pot not you think oh there's two in there it's great no you just want one uh, it'll actually make a stronger plant and a cleaner plant later on so on these I didn't get to right away so this is where everybody goes, oh my God, look at how big my plant is. It's amazing. Well, I'm going to cut that back. So starting at the bottom, I'm going to cut off all but one liter. And so I just want the one liter on the um, tomato. And then I'm going to prune everything off. So everything, these are what they call suckers. And these are the little... Um, uh, what would we call that? That's like what I call the armpit hair of a tomato. And it's the little, the little sucker that comes out of that. After 18 inches, this becomes your fruiting growth. You'll also get fruit off the side of the, 
the leader stem. But these you want to prune for the first 18 inches and you basically will prune off all growth for the first 18 inches. So I'm going to take all of these off and I'm just going to leave um, even my fruit because I just think it makes a stronger plant and I'm going to take all of those off for the first 18. So we have these in here and and you can see this is a sucker so I had this big leaf here we're gonna take that off we're always gonna take these off after the 18 inches after that 18 inches we're gonna cut that as far back as we can and after that 18 inches in colder climates I'm only gonna let these grow and I'm only gonna let the fruit that comes off the side shoots grow and that is um, how you prune a tomato for cool climates you will be amazed at the fruit that you get you'll be amazed at the varieties of tomatoes that you can grow if you don't do this you will not get a beefsteak tomato to fully ripen here it's too cold but if you do this you will get a beefsteak tomato to ripen here so these are the leaves that have they don't go anywhere they're just they're just big leaves and in the in the over in the valley or hot areas these leaves protect your tomatoes and with the heat they don't when they get that heat the plant can assimilate all the food and send the sugars into the tomato here we don't get enough heat so this leaf sucks up your sugar and this is what keeps your tomatoes from ripening. If you have a tomato plant that's all full and beautiful and you've got little tomatoes on it, literally if you prune this, you will see that in three to five days you can actually get ripe fruit. So it's once you do it, I don't think you'll ever go back to pruning it a different way. Um, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And so um, bigger is not always better in tomato plants sometimes you just want lots of fruit and so I will just continue to come out here on a daily to a weekly basis and uh, prune off all these shoots and we'll continue to do updates the other thing is when you're um, when you have your tomato plant it's the the clones or the cuttings the part of the tomato that you can make a cutting on you would cut off the little fruit if you wanted say you had a tomato that you absolutely love and it's in the fall and you don't you know you're gonna lose your tomato plant you can make cuttings and this is the this this fruiting growth that comes out of the armpits also known as a sucker from 18 inches and below these are the cuttings that you would uh, use to make new plants so that's about right. Sometimes you can cut off a few of the extra top leaves. Um, and so all this will become root. And then you have a new plant, commonly known as a clone. So that's how you can restart your own tomatoes so that you won't be in shortage. We're also, after I clean this up, we're gonna be adding um, a little bit of lime, which is a calcium basically base and or derived from calcium and that will keep our tomatoes from getting blossom end rot so i've put it out just so you guys could see it but i am going to mix it in um, and then i'm going to water it in and you can see how dry this is right here but down below it's actually wet and tomatoes like that they like the drier top later they want to search for their um for their moisture so you you want to let them dry out in between waterings and they'll do much better. Your tomatoes will be sweeter and you'll have less problems with disease. You can also see that I've opened this whole thing up. So now any tomatoes that were on the inside are actually going to get the sun and they're going to get ripe fast. The blossom end rot, I don't have any ripe tomatoes, uh, and but this is a squash that has blossom end rot and you can see where it's not fully developed and it got soft and that's a calcium deficiency and so even if you have really good potting soil 
you can get calcium deficiency. So um, just adding a little bit of lime is a great way to resolve that and not end up with it. And so that is our tomato tutorial. And okay. Okay, I, I, I have one last one, only five minutes. And uh, I think I'm gonna try that method this year. Um, I think it, last year I got a lot of those that mold and mildew, and I think this may help. Anyway, here's the last one. Uh, best tips for growing tomatoes on the coast with Scott Daygray with Rogers Garden. Hi, I'm Scott Dave. I own and produce Tomato Mania. Each year when we come to Rogers, we hear a lot about people growing on the coast and we hear, unfortunately, we hear that there are some challenges involved. And well, we want to talk about that this morning and give you a few hints that'll help you if in fact you're growing in an area that gets lots of coastal influence or if you're right on the water anywhere in Southern California. Here's the deal. Tomatoes are really willing little plants plant them and they'll generally, they'll generally grow very energetically through the season. But they want heat and that's the biggest challenge in some coastal communities and in coastal gardens. What you want to do as you site your garden and as you grow your tomatoes is provide as much heat as you can to those growing plants. In most of the tomato growing world, six to eight hours of sun is plenty to get a good harvest. However, if you're coastal, and if, you're, if you're summer, if your temps are more uh, temperate as the season goes along, you want to push that and make sure that you get eight to ten hours of sun for your tomatoes the entire season. That's the way you're going to do the best. Siting your tomato garden is really important too. Heat is often generated in different ways than just finding a sunny spot that, uh, that will sort of take care of your plants all day long. Do you have a sunny west facing wall or south facing wall? Those are really good tools to use in growing tomatoes. Plant in front of those. You can increase heat also by planting behind the house, behind the fence behind the hedge that blocks those coastal breezes that are inevitably cooling. You know how you go to the beach early maybe in the season and it's a little cool, but you put up a windbreak and then it's fine and nice and warm? Well, that's what you need to do for your tomatoes. Even a temporary screen around the tomato garden can help you out a lot because it raises temperatures. And in the end, that's gonna be great for your tomatoes. As they grow, or as you, again, you decide where to grow them, think about growing in pots. The soil in this container, and this is a pulp pot, which is another really great tool to use during the season. The soil in this container warms up more quickly and more completely than the soil in the ground. That's an advantage for you if you're growing at the coast. So if you haven't grown in containers before, try it. It's a really good tool and makes a lot of sense for anyone who grows in a more temperate zone. Then, as the season goes along, remember a couple things. The plant grows quickly, and you know that it will sprout little branches that we normally pinch or prune, some people do anyway. Um, as the season goes along. Pinch more if you're growing at the coast. Take off that growth that comes between the, right at the base of a stem and the, main, and the main stem. Take that off, remove it. That opens up the middle of the plant to more sun and more circulation, both great things for your tomatoes as the season goes along. And perhaps the most important thing, and this starts very early in the season and starts at Tomato Mania, I hope for many of you, is to take the time to choose the right variety that you're gonna grow in your coastal garden. Short season tomatoes are perfect for coastal gardens. This is what you're after if you've had problems in the past, if when we get unlucky and we have a foggy or, or sort of overcast early season, these are the tomatoes that work. This is early girl. This is the one that, that lots of us know. It will ripen in less than 72 days. Now that, when compared with some of the larger tomatoes that take 110, you can tell. There, that's an early tomato and that's the one you're going to be picking first and for many reasons that's why all of us grow early season or short season tomatoes. They'll grow well everywhere but they're perfect for the coast because they will flower and they will fruit in lower temps. That's the key. You have a much more temperate situation at the coast and you need a, a tomato that's been essentially bred for that. Many tomatoes that will work come from colder regions of the world. You may have heard of the Siberians. There's a tomato called Siberia. Sometimes you can tell by the name of the, the tomato that it's okay or, or, or great for colder regions. And again, I'm gonna translate that to coastal. Uh, Mountain Spring, Oregon Spring, Glasnost. Um, any, a lot of times you'll get, a, you'll get a clue from the name about, uh, about what it does and how quickly it ripens in the garden. 
Stupice, our Stupichka, is a Czechoslovakian heirloom that many grow. Jean Flamet is a French heirloom that people love. All of these are a little bit smaller. They generally grow in clusters, but they'll be the first things that you can pick in the garden, and they'll be wonderful, wonderful additions to the entire season. Most of them are smaller, so again, they're not always the big beefsteak that we dream of in the summer. But uh, you can grow lots of smaller tomatoes and trade with friends who have beefsteaks down the block or in another section of, of your neighborhood where they can actually grow the larger tomatoes. Thanks so much, and we'll see you at Tomato Mania. Okay, well, that's it for our show, and um, I will stop sharing here. If anyone has, I hope that you were able to get at least get some tips out of there, and that I hope you have a really successful uh, tomato growing season coming up. I know um, some of us have actually bought greenhouses, I think somebody in the audience right now, and uh, not me, though. So good luck on that. You'll be able to grow a lot more of those larger tomatoes. So if there's no questions, then I hope you have a really great evening and hope you enjoyed it. Hope to see you here next time.